This is just silly. Holy cow. Oh. That is heavy. Ooh, I wonder how heavy. Any guesses? 101.2 pounds, which is that many kilos. Now that it's in here, let's build a desk. Uh, you know what? Let's just leave that there for right now. Now you may be wondering why am I even building a giant desk made out of a walnut slab? Well, my client, we'll call him Steve, said, hey, Keith, I have this plastic folding table as a desk and I work from home. I'd love to use a giant slab and have a curve in the middle so that I can sidle right up to my work and maybe include some brass accents. And I'd love a big leg on one end and two legs on the other. Oh, and I love walnut. I said, Steve, I love walnut too. I think I can help you. Now, a lot of you asked where I get my lumber, and this specific slab came from Willard Brothers Woodcutters just outside of Princeton, New Jersey. And that there's my man Tobias, proprietor of said establishment, where he hooked me up with this monster walnut slab for about 1300 bucks. And with this beast strapped for transport, I could head back to the shop. Now, the overall design of this desk is pretty simple. One end has a giant leg and the other end has two smaller legs. So it looks pretty simple, but there's a lot of glue ups and a lot of shaping that needs to take place in order for these to happen. So let's get right to it. So for the actual meat of these legs, I had some other walnut slabs laying around so they were nice and dry, cutting off these live edges. And then I'll use these for each of the three legs. First order of business was to figure out how to maximize my material. So I took some measurements, looked at it over here, thought about it very hard, which almost put me to sleep, as you can see. Yeah, sometimes thinking is very tiring. But with all my thinking and figuring done, I could start breaking down and cross cutting the material to proper length. Now this height, the bottom from the floor to the underneath the desk needed to be a minimum of 26 and a half inches. And with the material I had, I was cutting it close. Now I don't always remember to do this, but I try to mark and label each piece on where they were cut because sometimes just looking at the grain, it's a little bit difficult to figure out. And if you write your numbers or delineations on top of the surface, then you'll just plane them right off. So if you write them on the end grain, they'll usually stay there for much longer. So with my parts kind of laid out, I could do my first round of milling. So after I surface one side, I can run it through the planer to get it flat and then I'll stack and sticker all of these pieces, let them acclimate to my shop over night, move, do whatever they have to do. And tomorrow we'll come back and do our final round of milling and start gluing up. So the next day with a change of shirt and hopefully underwear, I'll be honest, I don't quite remember. I could start laying these out. Little Lola joining us for some Saturday morning milling. So here's the tricky part. The wide leg at the one end needs to be double thickness as well as double wide as this. So I'm gonna cut this down the middle and use a side from each to put on here. And then I'm gonna take this piece and split it down the middle and use that to make up the other difference. Now you might be wondering why not just take this piece and glue it onto here to give you your double thickness. The reason I wanna split this and put this on both sides is because this crotch grain is pretty much running down the middle of this. So I really wanna maintain kind of the symmetry of this amazing looking figure right down the middle. Even though it's gonna be slightly off center, It'll be close. All right, now that you've been brought into the huddle and briefed on the game plan, it's over to the table saw to start ripping down some pieces to finish out our glue ups. Once those are marked, I wanna make sure the grain stays symmetrical on each side of the center piece. And then I'm gonna label them here as well to make sure that I don't screw anything up. As I mentioned before, I'm labeling the end grain and not the face grain because I'm about to mill the face grain right off. Ooh, that's gotta hurt. And let's not forget to joint those edges. We want perfectly flat, square stock for these glue ups. Now, some people believe that the best glue spreader on the market was the one you were born with. That's right, your finger. And I do subscribe to this. A lot of times I use my finger, but sometimes I like to use a roller for those days where I like to stay nice and clean. But the bottom line is no matter how you get that glue on there, you want a nice, even glue squeeze out when those clamps go on, as you can see there. Now, Type-On 3 sets up 
pretty quick. You can usually take it out of the clamps in about 30 to 40 minutes. Is it fully cured? No, but it's dry enough to move around. And since I have other glue ups to do with these blanks today, I want to get them out of the clamps and get moving. Because as you can see, Shopcat Lola can get a little impatient. Then I had to rip up a little bit more material and here's why. All right, so I was a little bummed out that I couldn't get the thickness I wanted for this leg. And then someone sent me a post on Instagram from an account called Bark and Burrow where he was working on a very similar leg profile for a table. So what he did was took another piece on each side and laminated this whole thing together to give you a thicker dimension. So I'm actually gonna add a couple pieces in the middle here too. And what this does is rather than having this be solid and having to waste all that material, I'm only using a couple ribs on each side. And then I'll be able to profile and carve whatever shape I want to. So let's get these glued on and pre-finished. Now I just mentioned pre-finishing and I'll get to that in a second, but as you can see, I just drew some layout lines here showing where my ribs are so I can put glue in the correct location and not everywhere else. Shopcat Jerry supervising, plenty of clamps needed on this one. And for these smaller ribs in the middle, I'm just driving some screws in since those will never come into play, I hope. No, they won't, we'll be good. Okay, now to the pre-finishing portion of our show. As you can see here, I'm taping out some lines where my ribs will go and I'm pre-finishing the inside because no matter what you build, you always want to finish both sides. Otherwise, one side will absorb and release moisture faster or slower than the other and cause your material to cup or warp. So to avoid that, I'm pre-finishing the inside while I have access to it. And I just use shellac. I put three or four coats on, it dries so fast and then 10 minutes I was done. And then I can make everybody's favorite treat, a walnut sandwich. Lots of clamps on this one. Got squeeze out all around. Really tighten this puppy down and we'll let that sit overnight. Now I'll be honest, I don't know if this was the next day or the day after that. Either way, took it out of the clamps and then over at the joiner, I could clean up all those glue lines, get that surface nice, flat and smooth. As you can see here, that grain blends in pretty good on those joints and Jerry found it acceptable enough to launch from. Now, before I started the shaping process on the big leg, I wanted to work on the two small legs and get those blanks glued up as well. So I just started by freehanding a little design with some cardboard. Now, if you remember at the beginning of the video, I showed the sketch up of the two legs and then the big leg. Well, that was kind of done after I had done these. And then I, well, I kind of drew them on the slab to see how they would look and Lola found them utterly fascinating. So with the shape roughly roughed out, I could rough out some material here to get me my thickness as well as my length. Now these ones, I had a little bit more material. So rather than the 26 and a half inches exactly, I could cut these a little bit long and give myself a little bit of play. And with all my pieces cut to rough length, I could head over to the joiner planer and get those milled up. And then with my material flat, I could head over to the table saw, rip off those rough edges and kind of get them ripped to rough width to glue up my blanks. And in an effort to save material, I'm doing the same thing I did with the big legs, and that's gluing some ribs uh, in the middle and on the outsides to give me the exact thickness I need. And to keep these pieces from sliding all around when I go to clamp them up, I'm just using some brad nails to keep them in place. And a lot of people suggest to me all the time to use salt to prevent this from happening. I've never found that trick to work, so I just stick with brad nails when I can. Whew, I needed an entire platoon of pony clamps for that one. And then at a later date, who can say really when, I could take all those blanks out of the clamps and start shaping. Well, first I needed to clean up all those glue edges, get the glue off, get my surfaces nice and flat and even. Now to make the template for the legs, I'm using the Shaper Origin. If you've never heard or seen of this, it is basically a handheld CNC machine. It's unbelievable. Now I borrowed this from someone, I did not buy it, yet. I'm sure I will eventually have one in my shop. So this machine works with vector files or an SVG file to be specific. And a huge thank you to Sean Kirsch at Shaper Tools who helped me with some file issues I was having when I was creating these. You know, I'm still learning. Now, once you have your file created, it gets uploaded into your personal Shaper hub and then downloads right to your machine where you can cut it. You can create the offsets, the depths, the bit size, all kinds of options. So with my piece cut, I could then head over to my blank and trace it out for the first step in the shaping process. 
Now to remove the bulk of the waste, I'm doing this on the table saw. And I think this ended up being about a 10 degree angle. And in retrospect, I actually wish I had come closer to my layout line and removed more material because that would have saved me much more hand planning later, which you'll see very shortly. Now, as I was cutting these, I quickly noticed a problem. As I went to cut the other side, you can see I no longer have a flat reference surface to ride along the table saw fence. So I took the off cut, some CA glue, glued that in place, which gave me a nice flat surface again, which I could then ride along the table saw fence and make this cut safely. And yet another crisis averted. And then once the final cuts were made, I could just pop off those pieces that I CA glued on. Guess I put a little too much CA glue. There we go. And then using some double-sided tape, I stuck the template to the top of my leg blank. And then I'm using this massive 7 eighths of an inch template bit from Bits and Bits and slowly make my way around to give that end of the leg the exact final shape that it needs to be. And there's a mighty good look at it right there. Now I won't show you, but I did the exact same thing on the other end. The idea is that my two ends are perfect and then I can just clean the waste out in the middle until the two ends meet. To do this, I'm starting off with this little mini Bosch power hand plane that I had, which is a pretty cool little machine and it works really well. But as you can see, I have a lot of material to remove. I really wish I had cut more off at the table saw, but so be it. And when I had got close enough to my layout lines for my comfort level, I turned to the hand tools. I'm just using a low angle jack here to remove a lot of this material. Yes, I could have gone much lower with the power plane, but I just got a little nervous. So I'd rather take this by hand from here on out. And this took a while. You can see all the shavings. It was quite a workout. And that was only one corner. So I got three more to go. And if you notice the straight edge on the big leg there, I was using that just to check and make sure there were no hollows and dips and I was staying flat from end to end. And as you can see, Jerry really enjoyed the walnut shavings being rained upon him. And you might be wondering like how long this took me. And the short answer is, I don't know. The long answer is, I really don't know. But once I was done with the power plane and the jack plane, I moved to the spoke shave to get the real finer details. And then Lola joined the party because she's like, hey, these shavings are pretty comfy. But the real star of the show is this cardboard. It's delicious. And then the final surfacing was done with my random orbital sander, which works best on curves like this if you use a soft pad. It helps conform to the shape a little bit easier and a little bit better and isn't as harsh. There's the straight edge, just check and make sure everything is flat. You can see I had a little hollow in the middle there, so just hitting the ends just a little bit. No need to try to take too much at once. Really want this to be nice and smooth all the way around. And then I just finished up everywhere else. It was definitely a process. It was fun though. It was fun to take something square and make it oblongish. So with the big boy done, and by big boy I mean 50 pounds that thing weighed, I could move on to the smaller legs. So using the shaper, I cut a template and then traced it around the top of my blank. Did the same process where table saw, cut the waste off. As you can see, I'm much closer to my layout line. Had to do the same thing here, gluing on a scrap cutoff to give me a flat reference surface to ride along the fence and then pop that off and move those over here. Double-sided tape to put my template down. And then it was back to the big boy spiral pattern bit to go around my template and get the top and bottom of each leg exactly to the shape I wanted. Take that off and then power plane again and back to the hand tools, a little spoke shaving and then finish up with the jack plane. As you can see, the lighter ends are getting darker as I plane exactly down to those layout lines. And then there you have a finished leg. Now, because I am going to be putting some leveling feet as well as threaded inserts on one end to mount it to the steel mounting plate to mount it to the actual top of the desk, I'm filling in with a little walnut here. So to get these to fit in perfectly, I'm just chamfering the edges so I don't get stuck with sharp corners some glue, and then I can just hammer these home. So these are gonna give me plenty of meat to screw into later. And again, this just saves a ton of material by filling that whole leg or three legs with solid material. And I did the same thing with the big boy leg. And with the legs pretty much set, I could get to fine tuning the slab. I needed to trim some edges and square some things off. So I'm gonna do this with the track saw. So I cut the one little chunk off on the other side of the crotch and then ran a straight line down the back. And with my straight line down the back, then I could square off the other end perfectly to that. 
And unfortunately, the capacity of the TS-55 came up just a little bit short, so I had to finish that up by hand. Then it was time to clean up all the edges, get off any kind of remaining bark that was in there. I'm doing this with 120 sandpaper and the soft pad on the random orbital sander. I also wanted to round off the corner so there were no sharp edges there that you could bump into and take out a manly part. So just use the sander to kind of gently shape that and then roll over those front edges as well. And then I turn back to the track saw because that live edge has about a 10 degree bevel on it. So I wanna match that all the way around. So I'm setting my track saw to 10 degrees and I'm gonna cut the back edge and the side edge or the side end or the end of the side. Now I had to flip the slab over to do this because you can only really go 10 degrees in one direction, which didn't go all the way through again. So I had to pry that off and then finish it up by hand. Total boat, baby. Then it was time to stabilize all those cracks and splits and bark inclusions. I'm of course using Total Boat High Performance Resin here, the medium hardener. I'm gonna add just a little bit of this pigment dispersion to it. Doesn't take much to turn this stuff jet black. So I'll mix that in. And then I could do everybody's favorite, the big epoxy pour. This is by far the largest epoxy pour by volume that I've ever done. And this one was actually a two or three day process because this hole was so deep and it kept soaking it in, I kept having to come back and add more. Now, while that was drying and I didn't film this, I put the two small legs up on the slab just to check proportions and dimensions, and I did not like it. They were way too big and chunky, so I resized my template, and then I had to resize my legs. And as you can see, I resized the template so I could actually just put it flush on one end and then just clean up the other end. That way I didn't have to do all the way around again. So it was a little less work, but still a lot of work. Now this one I did a little bit different. My buddy Brian Prusa said, hey, if you take the template off and then you can use what you've already routed as your secondary template, you can take even more material off that's exactly to where your template is, which will eliminate a lot of the hand tool work. And I said, hey, that's a great idea. So that's what I did on these ones. And then it was the same process. And after the power tool portion was done, it was back to hand tools with the jack plane and the spoke shave to get down to my layout lines. And once the epoxy had finally cured, I could scrape that off. Sometimes I use a card scraper to just get the bulk of it off because sometimes the sander will generate a lot of heat and almost reactivate that epoxy. And also since there's a big hump, sometimes when you put the sander on top, it'll teeter totter and you'll end up digging into your work. So if you get it as close to the surface as possible with the scraper, then you can come in with the sander and clean up the rest of the waste. Now this crotch here needed a little bit of cleaning up with some hand tools and some dental picks, some files. And then I busted out the Dremel. Now this crotch had some divots and inclusions and battle scars that I really wanted to try to maintain, but it was very difficult to clean up. So with a wire wheel and then this little sanding flap wheel, and then back to hand sanding with some sandpaper, I tried to keep it as natural looking as possible, but still clean it up nice and smooth. Now with some of these edges, I just hit it with the sander directly, but on this back edge, I decided, hey, let's take it a little easy. Let's take the block plane, make a chamfer first and rough it out. Now you may be wondering, why couldn't you just use a router bit with a roundover bit? Well, since we put a 10 degree bevel on that, the router really wouldn't sit exactly how it needs to be and the bearing would most likely dig in and it still wouldn't leave me a perfect roundover. So this was the method I used, little chamfer and then sand it nice and smooth all the way down. Now it was time to turn my attention to the mounting plates for all the legs. So I'll need one mounting plate for the big leg and then one mounting plate to incorporate the two smaller legs. So once I laid out where I want my bolts to go, I took those measurements, went into SketchUp and drew out the actual leg on the screen and then the mounting plate all around where I wanted the holes. Now the holes for attaching it to the leg as well as to the underside of the desk need to be elongated to allow for expansion and contraction of the slab itself. So I got all those laid out. Here you can see where I'm gonna mount it to the leg and then I drew my mounting plate and those are the holes I'm gonna use it to mount it to the desk. Now for the two legs, those are going to be angled in at 45 degrees each. So I wanted to lay those out on the desk first and then went to SketchUp, drew out the mounting plate, showing the legs in position. 
and you can see all the slots are elongated for expansion and contraction. Now there was a really cool detail that needed to be integrated into this desk. There's a huge crack on the front left corner that was stabilized with epoxy, but after talking with the client, we wanted to incorporate a little bit of brass in this, so some brass bow ties will really help stabilize that, as well as add a little bit of bling to this project. So I made a little field trip to my buddy Tom the Machinist, also known as Prestige Precision Parts on Instagram. I'll leave his links below. He was kind enough to fire up his Haas CNC machine. I think we started with three quarter inch thick brass, so milling the surface flat first. And he did this without lubrication on so I could at least get some good footage of the process. And then using another kind of end mill bit, you can see the bow tie shape coming into view. Now the original intent here was to have three different size bow ties in descending order. So I made a large, a medium, and this is the small. And in order to get both sides milled flat, Tom created these custom jaws so he could take it from one set of jaws, flip it over, and then finish the milling process right down to the bow tie on the other side. And here's what the footage would look like if Tom needed to run the coolant the whole time. And here's what it looks like coming directly off the CNC. Looks like I have some cleaning up to do. And here they all are, large, medium, and small, or venti, grande, and whatever the hell the other one is. Now back at the shop, I wanted to actually give these a little bit of a pillowed effect. So using a Sharpie just to give me a reference point, then I'm hitting this with a mill file to kind of round or chamferish those edges. And then I can go with the surface and kind of plane everything smooth. I said plane like I'm using a hand plane. File it smooth and kind of blend those edges in a little bit with the top surface before I hit it with the next round of sandpaper. I went up through the grits here. I did 400, 600, 800,000, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000 or so, and then steel wool. And some people say WD-40 acts as a great lubricant for this. I didn't try it, so I'm not really sure how much better it is. And then it was off to the three-stage buffing wheel and these sunshine polishing cloths do a great job of getting any excess dirt or debris or rubbing compound that was left from the buffing wheels now as you can see there's still some scratches in there i need to go back and remove but ultimately that thing's looking really nice now to drill the holes for the recessed leveling feet, I didn't have the right size Forstner bit that I needed. So I just turned back to the Shaper Origin, took my template that I had for the actual big leg, put three circles in there and cut those out. And then I secured it to the bottom of the big leg and then using a pattern bit, I just routed out the correct diameter. Now the cutting length on this little pattern bit is pretty small. So I used the pattern template first took that off and then using my existing hole I used that as the pattern again so I could go even deeper. And then I used a chamfering bit just to soften those edges a little bit when you reach in to grab the leg levelers. There's no sharp edges there. Now the beauty of using a Forstner bit for this operation is the little spur in the middle tells you exactly the center point of your circle. In this case, that didn't do that. So I took the circle that was cut out from the shaper, drilled a hole in the center using a center finder, and then used that to get the center of the recessed hole. Whenever I'm using a threaded insert, I always test a piece first because even though it says on the package what pre-drill hole size to use, that all depends on what kind of wood you're using. On a softwood, it may be too big, but on a hardwood, it may be too small. Now to secure these, I'm using a little bit of total boat, baby. Thick so, thickened epoxy. Now, do you necessarily need to put any epoxy in these? Not necessarily. If you have a nice tight fit, there's no way those things are coming out, but Sometimes I like to add a little security, especially in this big leg. You'll see later when I attach the legs to the tabletop, I do not use any epoxy. And then before doing anything to the smaller legs, I needed to cut those to length. I did this with a crosscut sled on the table saw. Two passes, as you can see, had to come from both sides to get the right thickness. And then rather than create a whole new template for the smaller legs, I just cut off an end of the big one and use the same process as before. And with all those recesses cut, the threaded inserts installed, I could get to work on the final sanding of all my pieces and prep for finish. As you can see, this slab gets to be a little bit unwieldy by myself, but I was able to manage it hernia free. And then I went through my sanding process. I went 120, 150, 180, 220. And then I came back by hand with 220, cleaned up any spots around the edges and took out any sander marks sanding with the grain. And then it was time for finish. For this one, we'll be using Osmo Pollux oil or Poly X oil. 
a hard wax oil, very similar to a Rubio. I just find that the Osmo doesn't amber and yellow up walnut as much as the Rubio Pure does. So this is what we're going with. The application process is identical though. I'm using a white scotch bright pad here to work it into the surface, making sure there are no dry areas. I'll let it soak in for 10 or 15 minutes and then come back with a microfiber cloth and wipe off all the excess. It should be dry to the touch after you wipe off all the excess. Now, after getting the underside of the desktop, I flipped it over, it's sitting on blankets, and then I could work on the top. Get the edges first, making sure there are no drips that had carried over from when I did the underside. And when you have a larger real estate area like this, I'm just using a plastic spreader to work the material around. And then I can attach a white Scotch-Brite pad to my random orbital sander, make sure you do not have the vacuum on when you do this and this really helps work it in all those nooks and crannies and into the grain much faster than you can do it by hand. After that, it's wiping off all the excess after about 20 minutes till it's dried to the touch. I'll let this sit for probably two days and then I'm gonna come back and put another coat on. Now for the steel mounting plates, I used an online service called OSH Cut. I believe they're out of Utah. There is another service that a lot of people use called Send Cut Send, but they were way more expensive. For these two quarter inch thick steel plates, it was about $140, plus all the excessive rush fees and shipping fees I paid to get these in two days. But their whole online store is super easy to use. You upload your files, it confirms that they are okay, it confirms your sizes, and you order it, you pick your material, and then they get to work on it. So I was really impressed with the quality of these, the accuracy of the cuts, the finish on the steel, superb. Now getting the steel plates was actually the easy part because the hard part was routing out the recesses for them to sit in the underside of the desk. The first step was to get them laid out roughly where I wanted them to be. I used a square to check and make sure that they were square to the back edge. And then I could put the legs on just to double check everything, see how it looked. Now it was kind of hamstringed with the big leg plate because it had that crotch there. So I couldn't go too far to the end. So I got that position where it needed to be. And basically eyeballed the other one. And when I finally figured out exactly where I wanted it, I used a white chalk pencil to trace around it so I didn't lose the position. And then I could do the same thing with the plate for the big leg. I kind of feel like that failed artist guy at a crime scene who gets to trace around the dead body with a piece of chalk. Do you think if we left the dead body right there on the sidewalk, you could manage to trace around it? Yes. Yes, I think I can do that. Now, since I already had these digital vector files that I created for the mounting plates, it was as simple as sending them over to the Shaper Origin so I could cut them out to the exact same size. Now, I did make them a quarter of an inch longer on each side to allow for expansion and contraction. And that is about as perfect as you can get. Now the next task was to hollow out all that material in between. Now you can do this a multiple of ways. You could keep going with the shaper, but that only has a quarter inch bit. So that's gonna take a month of Sundays to finish. So what I did was I used a big bit on the Festool router to clean out the majority of it. Then came back with the small trim router to clean up any waste in between. And as you can see, I got the Tamar three by three router jig there to span the full width of that recess so my router doesn't drop in. Then I could drop my plate in place and position it where I wanted it. Remember I left a quarter inch on each end and these strong magnets made by MagSwitch make it super easy to lift these heavy steel plates up and out of the recess without busting a fingernail trying to lift it out. So with my mounting holios marked, I'm just using an awl here to mark the exact center for my drill bit to guide itself into. I'll get those all drilled out for the threaded inserts after a little housekeeping, of course. And I'm also countersinking these holes so the threaded inserts sit flush or just below the surface. Now these are different threaded inserts than I used on the other legs. I actually much prefer these. I'll put a link in the description below for these ones. They're big boys. They're 5 16 18 by about 25 millimeters long or just over or almost an inch. And I did use a little bit of wax for lubrication as I screwed them in. Now, since we just exposed a bunch of raw wood, I wanna be sure and seal that. So again, I'm using just some straight up shellac here. I put about three or four coats on there and it was dry and ready to go. And I mentioned the shellac before, but here's exactly what I use. Bullseye seal coat, it's wax free. I do a 50-50 mix with denatured alcohol. And then I could drop the plate back in place and make sure everything lines up. I'll drop the bolts in there just to be sure. And I kind of screwed up when I had these plates made because I should have made these holes a little bit wider. I only made them a 32nd of an inch wider than the bolt, which doesn't give me much play. And this will come into play 
on the other side because I screwed up two of them in the wrong position. So I had to drill them out and then using this dowel plate, I'm making a custom dowel to fit perfectly. And as you can see, that is maple. That is not walnut that I am making this plug out of. Maple is much harder and I just felt it to be a better solution for this plug than using walnut. So with my dowel turned to size, I could then cut them to length on the chop saw and then over at the little belt sander, I'm just putting a little chamfer on the end just to make it a little easier for them to go into the hole. So with a little glue down in the hole, I could then plug them. And if you do have to do something like this, it's best to let this glue cure fully before you cut off the pegs and re-drill because otherwise there'll still be some moisture in there and the wood will probably be soft and you won't get that grab that you normally would with the threads. So with everything dried, I could drill those out and put the inserts back in, hopefully this time in the correct position. Spoiler alert, they were. Now I needed to put the threaded inserts in the legs themselves. So to do this, I'm taking the template that I cut for the leg and I'm positioning it where I want it on the mounting plate and then just drawing a chalk line around. Then I can put some double-sided tape down and bring my leg into view and drop it on. Now I would be lying if I told you I was 100% sure that tape was gonna hold as I lifted this up and over, but it did, thankfully. Whew. And then I could just transfer the location of my holes real quick with a white chalk pencil. As you can see, I use this white chalk pencil a lot on Walnut. There's a link in the description below. It's actually a sewing chalk pencil that apparently seamstresses use on fabric. And then I could just pluck that off and get to work on drilling and installing the threaded inserts. So using a 7 16 bit, I'm just pre-drilling all these holes. Now these are one inch long threaded inserts, so I'm going about an inch and an eighth in. Once those are drilled, I'll come back with the countersink as I did on the other ones. Now typically I drive these home by hand with a T-handle Allen wrench. I do that for a couple reasons. Primarily because I wanna make sure that I'm putting those in straight and sometimes that's very difficult to do with a drill. But these I pre-threaded by hand first with an insert and then I felt comfortable coming back with a drill. And then before going any further, I just double checked the position of all of them with the bolts and they looked good. Then I could bring it over to the actual desktop and drop it in place and see how it fit. Well, I think we knew it fit, but I guess I just wanted to see how it looked. Now, there was another little snag in this whole operation. When I had these steel plates made, I couldn't have the holes countersunk. And this was hardened steel, so I didn't have any tools to do this myself because, well, I'm a woodworker. So the only other alternative was to actually route out recesses for the bolt heads to sit into which wasn't a big deal, but I would have preferred to use bolts that were countersunk into the steel. So I made sure to elongate the slots, just like everything else, to allow for wood movement, just in case that thing wants to move, and then raw wood, so I sealed it up with shellac. Now to get the position of the threaded inserts on the two smaller legs proved to be a little bit more complicated. Now since I knew the dimensions of the leg, which about four and a quarter inches wide by about seven and a quarter inches long, I could then draw some reference lines on my steel plate. So I drew the rough outer dimensions and then a center line on the plate as well as the center line on the leg. You can see my little chalk line there and then just traced around the leg. And I did this on both sides. And then just like the big leg, I just used some double-sided tape down on the metal plate and then stuck the leg into position. And then I just repeated the same process for the other leg. Then things got a little tricky here because I was trying to figure out how to spin this. I was really afraid that these things were just gonna come flying off and get damaged. So I reached the point where I just said, screw it, let's flip it and see what happens and everything stayed where it should. Then I could transfer the whole locations to the actual legs. And then it was another head scratcher because I couldn't get the plate off. The double-sided tape was so strong. So then I had to awkwardly lift it back up on the bench and <laughs> pluck each leg off. As you can see, those things were on there. Uh, wait for it. Oh, there it is. That's what happens when you don't secure your workpiece. So I had to call these little chicken legs into action to hold everything in place. And if any of you are sitting there thinking, why don't you use an impact driver? For shame. Impact drivers do not belong <laughs> in furniture making. Just a little demonstration there of the slotted holes, how those will work for expansion and contraction. And then I could lift this beast back up and into place just to double check everything. 
Now, typically I'll use a wooden medallion you've seen with my logo on it to kind of sign my work. But in this case, I'm gonna use a branding iron because I've had this thing that Gearheart Industry was kind enough to send to me and I just don't use it that often. So I wet the surface and I really should have done this before I put finish on it for better results, but I forgot. So wipe away the water and there you have it. Branded for life, like a steer in a cattle ranch. Now I get asked a lot what I use to sand in between coats. This is a sanding sponge I've had for years. It was a 220 grit or a fine grit sanding sponge that there's really not much grit left on there. So it started as a 220, now it's probably a 600 or 800, but there's just enough grit on there to break down any dust nibs and rough up the surface and get it ready for the next coat. And once it's all roughed up, I'll get all that dust off with a microfiber cloth. I'll sometimes blow it off with compressed air or hit it with the vacuum. And then it was time for the second coat. I already did the underside. So now is the top. I'll start with the crotch. I'll leave that there for a minute and then finish the top. Now I'm gonna let this cure for a day or two and then come back for the most stressful operation of this entire build. And that's inlaying the brass bow ties in the top. Now I already had the digital file created for the bow ties, which is how Tom and the Machinist cut them on his CNC. So I uploaded that to the shaper and then I'm just doing some test cuts in a sample piece. I wanna make sure everything lines up, it's the right size before I actually do it to the top of the desk. Now the cool thing about the Shaper Origin is you can set your cut to be on the inside of the line you create, the outside, down the middle, or even an offset on the outside or inside. So what I'm gonna do here on the test is I'm gonna do an offset inside. That way I'll go around and then I'll do a slight offset, which will make it a little bit bigger and do the final cleanup pass all the way around. So with the two recesses cut, I could then square off the corners with a chisel and then test fit my actual brass bow ties. And once I confirm the fit, well, it was go time. So I placed each of the bow ties roughly in the position where they will be. And then I could assume my chalk outline guy duties. Then I'll be able to see on the screen on the shaper exactly where I need to cut. Then with my shaper tape in place, and now I could call up my file and, and place it where I had put my layout lines. And the touch screen lets you zoom right in. As you can see, my spacing where I laid them out was a little off, but that's okay. The big one is really the key here. Once that's lined up, the smaller one will just fall into place next to it, however it's spaced in the file. And before I set the depth of my cut, I just use some calipers to double check the thickness of my bow ties, which is 0.497. So I'm gonna actually make this pocket 0.49. Again, these are pillowed slightly, so I want them to sit slightly above the surface. And hopefully the 0.007 will give me that. I'm also going to change the offset for the first cut to 0.05. That will bring me just inside my final cut. And then I can go back and make a clearing pass at the end. So then I could start my first pass cut all the way around, and then I'm gonna change this to pocket, and I'm gonna clear out all that material in the middle with the router bit, and then I can change my offset to the final dimension of my cut and clear that up. And let's see how it looks. Phew! I cannot tell you how relieved I was that that first one came out, but there's still one more to go. Are you as nervous as I am? Oh boy, let's see what we got. Okay, no panic yet. Looks okay, whew. All right, let's just clean up those corners. And the key here is to use as small a chisel as possible and go very slow. It's very easy for the beveled edges of those chisels to dig into the sides of your recess and kind of ruin the neatness of the line that you just created. So we wanna make sure that those stay nice and crisp. And now the moment of truth. That one fits nice and tight. And the little guy, looks like that's gonna work too. I also roughed up the bottoms and the sides with some 80 grit sandpaper just to give it a little more bite when I put the adhesive in there. And by adhesive, I of course mean total boat, baby. That's right, I used a little high performance epoxy. I just used a little bit. I didn't want to flood this opening with epoxy and then it starts bubbling out the sides when I push the bow ties in. And I'm just using a rubber mallet and this little crubber here or cork rubber, just a soft pad so that when I hit it, it doesn't dent or damage the brass. And then with the small one safely in its home, I could move on to the big one and use the same process, little mallet with a little crubber and get it seated securely. And then with a polishing cloth, just clean up any residue. I also hit it with a coat of Osmo and then a little Renaissance wax just to protect it from tarnishing. And after a little buff, we're ready for delivery.
And then once on site, it was basically screwing everything together like they put together the Statue of Liberty when the French gave it to us. Wait, no, that came over in one piece. Or did it? Really? No assembly required? I guess. And then I could also screw in the adjustable leg levelers, which, by the way, look like Oreo cookies. And then the client was gracious enough to risk a back injury or hernia to help me lift this thing over. And now some final beauty shots. This was kind of hard to get a picture of just because of the lighting and the size of the room, so hopefully these do it justice. Wow, that is some serious grain and a really nice crotch. And how about another look at those brass bow ties? Whew. So after you factor in the top, the legs, the metal plates, we'll add the bolts and the finish, you're looking at almost a 200 pound desk there. Wow. Hey, and if you like Live Edge furniture, be sure to go check out this dining table I did a while back. It's got live edges on both sides, huge mortise and tenon joints, and, well, a ton of other stuff. So go check it out.